So sometimes when you're going throughout your collecting journey, you become confronted with this new feature on a watch or just some feature about a watch that you never really considered as being a big deal until you actually owned a watch with that feature. And today we're gonna to be talking about these types of features, underrated features in the world of watches. So how this is going to go, we have about eight of these that I have just kind of carved out as being things that I recognize as being things I like to see. I don't think enough people talk about them. I don't think brands sometimes put enough emphasis on this and really just talking about them, giving it more of the spotlight so that might be something that you consider in the future when you're looking to buy a watch. Now, I wanna stress this at the beginning, this is my opinion. Some of these features might be not a good concept for you to look for in a watch. You might not like some of these features that I like. So that's the fun thing about all this. I like what I like, you like what you like. I think we can just leave it at that, but I'll give some reasoning why I think they're underrated. And maybe you'll agree, maybe you'll disagree, but here are my eight underrated features of watches. Now, before we jump into this video, if you wanna test your watch knowledge, whether you're newer to watches or you wanna just test whether or not you know what you need to know, check out our article down below, looking at different parts of a watch that you should know. Again, this is a great way to test out your knowledge if you're newer into the game or to ensure that you have all your bases covered if you're a more seasoned collector. A link will be in the description down below. Definitely check it out after watching this video. Now for feature number one, we have micro adjustment. And micro adjustment is not a new concept for brands. And in many cases, sometimes is not even a concept that they consider at all, which is pretty crazy if you think about how valuable it is if you've ever owned a watch with good micro adjustment. Now micro adjustment can be seen in a variety of different cases and can be done in a variety of different ways. The most common ways you'll see brands achieve the concept of micro adjustment is through having small little holes in a clasp, but they can move the spring bar around to adjust the length of the bracelet to small little millimeter type increments. This isn't the most sexy way of pulling this off, but for me, it's absolutely adequate and something that I'd love to see. If I'm getting a dive watch and I have those small little holes that I can manipulate and move the spring bar inside to allow my wrist to have some more flexibility throughout the year, I love this. And then if you go a step further, then you're talking about on the fly adjustment, no tools needed. This is absolutely the chef's kiss of micro adjustment. There's a lot of brands that have now started to dabble with this more. If you look at the more attainable side, you have a brand like Mito that does a very exceptional job. It's not as maybe refined as some of the other options we'll mention here next, but still to see this in a watch around a thousand to $1,500 is great. In addition, you have Tudor with their T-Fit. Omega has some pretty good class with their on-the-fly adjustment with like their Seamaster Diver 300, a little thicker, but still very well done. Rolex is class leading, of course. And then even a brand like Geo and how they're able to hide the extension mechanism within the button on the clasp. This is just something that I have just come to appreciate tremendously. There are of course limitations to this when you're dealing with more like deployant style clasp or butterfly style clasp. It's hard to pull this off in the same way. So I think some collectors need to be a little bit maybe more open about what brands can feasibly pull off. But as somebody who has watches that have micro adjustment and don't, Oh man, it's a really nice feature to have. For this next one, I'm not gonna spend as much time on it. And I think there's going to be some people that will disagree with me on this, but AR coding. Now, AR coding can be a bit of a mixed bag for some, considering how many layers you're talking about. If it has a hue to it, some of them will give off a different shade of color. And then also you're dealing with the double side AR, which I'm a huge fan of, but some people might not like because it does create small little abrasive type of marks that can uh, appear on the front side of the crystal because of that additional layer. I own several watches with double AR, I think it looks fantastic. For some reason, I can deal with scratches easier than I can deal with sometimes reflections. Maybe that's because we do a lot of watch photography. And I think one of the big joys of making watches look great is making sure there's not any really gnarly reflections on the dial. And when you have double AR, oh my goodness, it looks like you could just grab the hands, just grab everything on the dial. It's like nothing is there, it just disappears, the crystal. And I think this looks fantastic. You have different sorts of AR coatings and there's brands that do it really well, some brands that you know, do a nice job. I think some of the leaders when you're talking about double AR coding, Zinn, Mito does a nice job, Certina, Omega with the Aquateras, Globemaster, Breitling does some good stuff too with their Super Ocean line. And even if you're not looking at double AR, brands like Seiko, Grand Seiko, I think they have very tasteful treatments of it as well. I do think there are some that will go against the double AR concept. I love the look of it. If you just look at like a Zinn 556, the hands just look, you can just grab them. I mean, like there's no crystal there, just 
this appears. I love the look of it. Uh, others will not like the potential downside that will come with maybe some small abrasive for scratches, but you really have to nail the thing against something to really see that uh, become an issue. And you have to probably be a little bit more uh, sensitive to those type of concepts as well. Like I don't mind seeing a scratch uh, too much in one of my watches. They're meant to be worn anyway. And I just love being able to admire my watch without any reflection. So this is a good thing for someone like me. Now for our next feature and almost just a type of watch, we're looking at high frequency, specifically high frequency quartz movements. And we can also throw in some high frequency mechanical watches as well. Now, some of the reasons why high frequency is going to be a interesting feature for me is because there are also accuracy elements. But if you remember the video that I posted about overrated features, I mentioned as accuracy being one of the overrated points. And I still stand by that. So I'll just draw the distinction here. I think for a mechanical watch, Accuracy is not as big of a deal as I think most people make it out to be. But when you're starting to ascend into quartz watches, when accuracy becomes more of the function of the tool, uh, mechanical watches, yes, there is an element of that, but I think people have unrealistic expectations. There hasn't been a mechanical watch in decades that has been able to match that of a quartz watch. So if you are about accuracy and that's what you're leaning into, that's where quartz becomes more viable. Uh, but even in the case of high frequency, there's other things that become benefit when you look on the mechanical side uh, that also make them pretty cool. Specifically when you look at chronograph calibers, being able to judge uh, different increments of time at a more precise degree. I think a very obvious example would be Zenith with the El Primero movements. You're able to see one tenth of a second on their 3600 calibers that we've recently seen uh, being refreshed. You also can look at centigraphs and being able to judge precise periods of time. Is that really that useful in an everyday? Perhaps not. But the big thing I want to focus on here is more looking at high frequency quartz movements because I think the upsides there are even higher. Higher. For mechanical watches, there are some downsides when it comes to high frequency, but for quartz, a lot more upsides than really the trade-offs that come with it. A standard quartz oscillator operates at 32,768 hertz. In comparison to a traditional watch or even just a high beat watch, you're looking at five hertz. So the amount of oscillations happening per second in comparison to a mechanical watch is absurd. And that's why a conventional quartz movement is usually plus or minus 15 seconds a month to plus or minus 30 seconds a month, depending on what brand and model you go for. Uh, but then even further from that, if you're talking about high frequency quartz movement, which I think this is where it gets really cool and it's underrated. You're looking at the precision with 262 thousand hertz, uh, plus or minus 10 seconds a year in terms of accuracy. You then can look at something like Citizen, the most accurate watch in the world that they produce. The C100 has 8 million oscillations per second. Absurd plus or minus one second per year. Now, some people might, again, not care about this and they just don't necessarily like quartz watches in general, uh, but I just think not enough people talk about high frequency quartz movements and some of the cool benefits of that. Uh, also being able, again, to track, say, even finer periods of time. You looked at, say, like the Bulova Lunar Pilot because it's a high frequency quartz movement. You have a tenth of a second indicator just rolling on uh, that register. There's just some cool benefits uh, to high frequency that I don't think it talked about enough, especially on the quartz side. There might be some that disagree with me on that point, but I'm going to stand by it. So I'm going to present two in one here. So these are our next two features that I think are underrated. First, quick release, and then second, drilled lugs. Now, both of these basically accomplish the same goal in theory. They make it easier to swap out straps on watches. For quick release, I think this is the most beneficial when you're dealing with watches that have more custom integrations with straps. Look at the overseas from Bastion Constantin, some of the best integrated type of systems with their strap and bracelet replacement. It's so easy as long as you have adequate fingernail length you can make this happen very simply. The Tissot PRX has quick release, not as easy to deal with as some of the other uh, utilizations of this type of quick release system. It's still nice to have and utilize if you have it at your disposal. And just generally when brands offer up quick release straps with their watches, I think that's nice. If I don't have to go ahead and grab a spring bar tool to switch out a strap, I mean, that makes me want to just maximize my looks a little bit more. Now, some brands are a little bit too crazy with how much they just market this and they think it's like the new greatest thing in the world. Like people have known about this for quite some time brands. We need to uh, come to grips with this, but it still is nice to have on some of your watches in your collection. Then you have drilled lugs. Pretty simple concept, poke some holes in the freaking lugs. I mean, that's not really much to ask. It doesn't take much unique manufacturing, but it goes a long way. If I don't have to use uh, the spring bar tool, uh, the fork end to get out a strap 
And some straps and bracelets are harder to get out than others. So having that at your disposal uh, is nice. And also in addition to that, does make it a little bit easier to avoid scratching the case. You can look at the Explore 2 16570 with its drilled lugs. I think that's great. There are plenty of watches with these drilled lugs, but it just gives you more flexibility, ease of switching out straps, and gives you that new watch feel without having to, of course, buy a new watch. Now, this is not necessarily a feature, I guess, but I guess you could say it's a feature. I'm just going to throw it in here and I don't think anybody's going, going to disagree. It's lug to lug. Now, is that necessarily a feature or a aspect of a watch? I mean, I guess this is now kind of all encompassing in a way by including this, but I mean, can we all agree that knowing the lug to lug and marketing that is an important thing? I just think it's one of the most neglected concepts in the industry, even when we're selling watches from brands like it's very difficult at times to try to make sure we can just get all the lug to lug dimensions just because brands just don't offer that. Like we would have to go and measure out every single watch to offer it up and we do it as much as we can, it, but it's hard because brands just don't even think about this at all, but it does play a huge part. I think there is a feature aspect of this that does make a watch maybe viable or not viable for you. You look at something like the Seiko Turtle. I mean, you're talking about a watch that's like 45 millimeters in diameter, but then you have a lug to lug that's mirroring that of the Tudor Black Bay, which makes that much more viable for a wide variety of wrists out there. And also gives you a sense that there's just more than what is maybe being presented by the brands. I think they clearly think about it. Some brands don't think about it and some brands uh, neglect it. I think an example of maybe overlooking this a, a bit was with like, say some of those Longines models, like the Skin Diver as an example, like the Skin Diver, I thought was just such a killer looking watch. They think they're moving away from it, but the lug to lug prevented many people from pulling it off because the proportions were just off. I think a brand that incorporates this well, despite there being, of course, longer lugs is Nomos. They make it very clear in their specs what their lug to lug dimension is. They're clear about it. It's part of their case silhouette and they present sizes that allow this to still be viable on a wide variety of wrists uh, because they offer some different sizes and optionality for people. So lug to lug, that's all I'm going to say. Could you argue it's not a feature? Perhaps, but I'm still gonna, of course, mention it in this list. Now for our next one here, we have hacking and I am not the biggest stickler for this and always having hacking on every single watch. I have watches that don't necessarily have hacking. I think it's okay, but I don't think you can argue that it is a nice feature to have. I think when you're dealing with very attainable watches and then also watches where chronometric precision is not the main focus, I could get away with it. But it is funny when brands like will describe like being tested at all these different positions, talking about optimal isochronism, and then they don't even have the thing hack. So I, I get it. I get why some people are very hard about this subject. I don't think you necessarily need it, but is it nice to have? Absolutely. I don't know if you can even say it's underrated because I think a lot of people like this feature now ever since we've seen the just continued growth of like the watch enthusiast community on the internet it is something that people like to throw around there and people do ask questions about it all the time. Does the movement hack? Does the movement hack? I don't think it's always necessary, but again, it's nice to have, I think for many people, especially if you are a brand that's quoting about chronometric precision, testing across different positions, even at the high horology tier, which surprisingly, those are probably the most guilty parties of not including it. And now for our final feature on the list, power reserves. So some people think that these are overrated. I think power reserves are incredibly useful when you have more than just a few watches. Cause I, as somebody, I like to switch out my watches all the time. I, I like to have a free rotation. I'm always trying new things on. I'll have stuff from my personal collection. I'll have stuff that I'm kind of test driving for a review. I'm always changing things out. And it is at times, once you have too many watches, now this is like, I mean, talk about some you know pathetic problems that have too many watches. It's is can it can be time consuming to have all this set up you have to retime all your watches get everything going i mean it is a, a, an amazing thing where you can just not look at a watch for a few days sometimes and just be able to pick it up right away uh, i didn't recognize how valuable this was until i started to get watches with you know longer power reserves 70 hours uh 80 hours five day power reserves i mean it is very nice to see that uh when you start to have more watches i think some of the pioneers of this were going to be you know say tudor with their mt calibers rolex now shifting into that grand seiko has some great 
great options. Long Jean, in addition to that, having 70 hours. You also look at the Powermatic family of movements and what is able to be accomplished there with that 80 hour power reserve, pretty much being class leading for that range. And then jumping up to even things like Oris and Bomb and Mercier, five day power reserves for watches in that three to $4,000 range is simply phenomenal. For some, I can understand why they might think this is overrated, but this is where I say, it's my opinion and I think power reserves are pretty cool. And it's also a great differentiator when you're dealing with some of the off the shelf type of movements, if, let's say like the Etta 2824, uh, Salita and their offerings more in that 38 to 40 hour range. And then you can jump in and get something for 70 hours being twice as long. I mean, that's fantastic. And I think it is a good differentiator when you're going down the checklist of things to consider when looking to buy a watch. But all right guys, that is my list looking at eight underrated features of watches that I think maybe more people should consider when looking to buy. Uh, of course, this is again, my opinion. So if you disagree, you can let me know in the comments down below. If you agree, please give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, hit the bell icon, really would appreciate that. Also definitely check out teddybaldeso.com, full authorized dealer of 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and a full factory warranty for all the products that we offer. But guys, thank you guys so much for watching. Be well, and I'll see you all very soon.